Welcome to Tech Tales. I'm Corbin Davenport. And I'm Adam Conway. And today we are talking about Google AMP, which is one of those things that probably most people wouldn't know from hearing it, but I would I would venture to guess most of the people listening to this have actually used it at one point, unknowingly. Oh yeah, it's everywhere. And perhaps against their will. <laughs> yeah. Almost exclusively against my will. So before we get to AMP, I kind of want to talk about why we got there. What, what was the path that led us to create this weird thing? So I need to talk about how the internet on mobile devices happened. And I'm going to say mobile devices. That includes smartphones. The things before smartphones, PDAs, flip phones, whatever. There's gonna, there's a lot of generalization here because I don't want to say like 500 words. So, basically, we're starting when the World Wide Web was invented in 1989 by uh, Tim Berners Lee while working at CERN, and around like 1991, it started to be used uh, outside universities, and that was kind of when the the web as we know it today. Uh, kicked off and the web evolved quickly in those first few years it moved from very simple pages that were just text and and links to more text to websites with videos and scripting and embedded plugins we had java we had flash all that fun stuff um and throughout that time, there were really only a few phones around then, like in the 1990s, that could connect to sort of web services. Uh, there was like the Nokia 9000 communicator, but most phones were, were still just calling at this point. In 1999, we got the introduction of WAP, which stands for WET. At oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong acronym. <laughs> uh, it's a wireless application protocol. And it was uh, founded by Ericsson, Nokia, Motorola, and Unwired Planet. Remember when Ericsson made phones? What a, what a good time that was. And, and Motorola, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Back when Motorola was... Uh, relevant might be a strong term, but like more relevant. Yeah. WAP was designed as a complete internet stack capable of running on late 1990s mobile phones and cellular networks. Uh, so basically, it was like an, a different version of the TCIP and HTTP standards that were used in the desktop web, but it, it functionally worked the same. Like you could type in a website and it would load something. So uh, these phones still couldn't really render normal web pages. There was a special WAP format of websites, and they were written specifically for small screens and limited navigation because, again, phones had like three buttons for that. And they were written using WML and WML script instead of HTML and JavaScript. Eventually, we started getting mobile browsers that could render some normal web pages. So, like uh, early Pocket Internet Explorer and Opera Mobile could do this, but performance was really bad. <laughs> they just did not have the resources for that. And you run into the same issue like today, where if you try to load a desktop site on a phone, it just it doesn't really look all that great. And you have to zoom in and out. And it's, it's not a good experience. I, I remember in the mid 2000s, there was even like on the Nintendo DS, if you had like one of those, uh, those flash oh, yeah. cards, you could have like oh, yeah. DS organize and that allowed you to load like really basic web pages and stuff on it. Yeah, I, I didn't have the, the DS browser, but I did have the Nintendo DSi which had a, a slightly better web browser. The, the one with the DS was a, was a homebrew thing. It, was a, it ran on like the DS's really small RAM and the pages you loaded. Like if, if you loaded a page with too many, too many images, your DS just crashed. Like it was no, whereas the official browser at least had like a RAM expansion that went in the GBA slot. <laughs> yeah, he used the Game Boy cartridge for yeah. RAM. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy times. Uh, oh boy. So, so then in uh, 2007, we get the first iPhone, which had a nearly complete version of the desktop Safari web browser from the Mac uh, with pretty decent performance and HTML5 features. It, it notably didn't have like Flash and Java and all the other plugins that were, were still very much a part of the web. So it wasn't like 
you finally get the desktop web on your phone, but it was a lot closer to that. And then the next year, we got the first Android phones, uh, which had a similar WebKit-based web browser. And then uh, Windows Phone eventually caught up, sort of. Uh, and now we're finally in this era where mobile devices can pretty much use the same web. Um, but there's still a lot of websites that have mobile-specific versions or just aren't optimized for that still. So, like, the technology's kind of there, but not the the whole ecosystem. Yeah, and the, the difference, I guess, now is that it's not computationally limited. It's, like, UX, UI, like, like the form factor of the device instead. Because I remember right. even back then, like, uh, I think it was Dolphin Browser had, like, its own like weird flash applet and stuff built in that you could get on like 2012 and android phones to use like flash applications um and it was not good like don't get me wrong it was not good but it was a way of getting some of those kind of things working on your phone in a way that really stretches the definition of the word working so it was a weird time yeah i had dolphin on my uh, asus transformer pad and it was it was not good, but it kind of worked. Yeah, and I I remember also there was that I forget what it was called, but there was that web browser for the iPad that like used like remote desktop, so it could do flash <laughs> embeds. Oh. You were like loading loading the web page on like a like it was like a it, it was loading it from a server, but to you it looked like the web browser was on the iPad. Oh my god, you're reminding me how terrible the internet was. <laughs> <laughs> it, was it was really bad. <laughs> wow. Kids these days don't know the struggle of, of trying to load cool math games yeah, on an yeah. iPad. <laughs> now, now, now they just have Snapchat and, I don't know, Genshin Impact maybe and Fortnite. Yeah. <laughs> Kids these days, but they're better video games. <laughs> yeah. And what better web browsers. <laughs> so kind of the last step to unifying the mobile and desktop web was the introduction of CSS media queries, which happened in sort of the early 2010s. And that made it possible to have one website that could change its layout based on the screen size, which was like the last missing piece here. So you can actually see this if you go to a website like uh, YouTube or like CNN.com on like a desktop computer and you have a, a big browser window and you make the browser window really small, it'll adjust to like a phone layout. That's what that is. So y you could like kind of do that before this, but like that just makes it so much easier. So that's sort of the last piece here. And now we, we finally have a unified web across desktop and mobile, we can send each other links and it loads kind of the same. But there were still a, a few small issues here. Big issue is that mobile data networks were still slow in much of the world. Uh, other issue is a lot of websites still took several seconds to load, even if you had a really good connection, especially sites with a lot of embedded images and videos and ads. And uh, some sites still had mobile-specific versions because it, in certain cases, it was still easier to just have a separate mobile site. Like, actually, Wikipedia still does this, and I'm not entirely sure why. Even though, like, we're, we're technically there, we're, there's still issues doing this. So one of the solutions to this, I'm putting solution in big air quotes, you can't see I'm doing air quotes, is in May 2015, Facebook introduced a new feature called Instant Articles, which tried to solve this uh, performance loading issue for web articles. So I've got a, a snippet of a blog post from Facebook for you to read. When do I tell people I can't read? <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, we're excited to introduce Instant Articles, a new product for publishers to create fast, interactive articles on Facebook. As more people get their news on mobile devices, we want to make the experience faster and richer on Facebook. People share a large uh, people share a lot of articles on Facebook, particularly on our mobile app. To date, however, those stories take an average of eight seconds to load, by far the slowest single content type on Facebook. Instant articles make the reading experience as much as ten times faster than standard mobile web articles. 
Along with a faster experience, Instant Articles introduces a suite of interactive features that allow publishers to bring their stories to life in new ways. Zoom in and explore high-resolution photos by tilting your phone. Watch autoplay videos come alive as you scroll through stories. Does anybody want that? Explore interactive maps, listen to audio captions, and even like and comment on individual parts of an article in line. I didn't even know you could do that last part. This is really funny now that uh, F- Facebook now does not want you to post news at all. Like, they do not care about this whatsoever. Oh, yeah. The whole thing is basically to entrap you within their ecosystem so you never leave. Yes. Wow, it's crazy. You're, you're spoiling the episode, Adam. <laughs> oh, sorry. My bad. I- ignore me. Facebook Instant Articles were specially designed web pages, which sites uh, could publish alongside their regular web articles. So we're back to this idea of like a separate, worse version of something for mobile devices. Um, Facebook Instant Articles used very simple HTML5 markup with limited customization, which made them load faster than most full featured websites. When someone clicked on an article link on Facebook, it would load the instant article version if it was available. And Facebook claimed that instant articles received 20% more clicks than mobile web articles from the news feed, and people were 70% less likely to close the article before reading it when compared to normal articles. And uh, they got a few big names for this initially. The launch partners for Instant Articles included the New York Times, BuzzFeed, NBC News, National Geographic, BBC News, and The Guardian. Uh, Also in that same year, in 2015, Apple launched Apple News, which had its own kind of weird and minimal format, but it, it wasn't really like Facebook Instant Articles, where it was something that like would replace a link and like you would share that and, and someone else would see that link it was like a custom version you would only see in apple news in october of 2015 google revealed a similar technology called amp uh, so i've got a, another thing for you to read here this is a blog post from google i'm shaking with anticipation hurry up <laughs> <laughs> Now, as with any blog post uh, from Google, this is entirely full of lies. So. Ah, brilliant. Yes, I'm used to these. Smartphones and tablets have revolutionized the way we access information, and today people consume a tremendous amount of news on their phones. Publishers around the world use the mobile web to reach these readers, but the experience can often leave a lot to be desired. Every time a web page takes too long to load, they lose a reader, and the opportunity to earn revenue through advertising or subscriptions. That's because advertisers on these websites have a hard time getting consumers to pay attention to their ads when the page is slowed so slowly that people abandon them entirely. Today, after discussions with publishers and technology companies around the world, we're announcing a new open source initiative called Accelerated Mobile Pages, which aims to dramatically improve the performance of the mobile web. We want web pages with rich content like video, animations, and graphics to work alongside smart ads and to load instantaneously. We also want the same code to work across multiple platforms and devices so that content can appear everywhere in an instant, no matter what type of phone, tablet, or mobile device you're using. The project relies on AMP HTML, a new open framework built entirely out of existing web technologies, which allows websites to build lightweight web pages. Over time, we anticipate that other Google products, such as Google News, will also integrate AMP HTML pages. And today, we're announcing that nearly 30 publishers from around the world are taking part too. Wow, doesn't that sound exciting? Woo. (laughs) Yeah. I just, I get so excited. It's the XKCD of like, uh, we need a new standard. This will this will bring everybody together. <laughs> it literally is. <laughs> yeah. This is no no joke. Like that was part of the initial pitch for AMP was like everyone was saying that like Facebook was doing a weird light pages thing and Apple was doing a weird light pages thing and Google was like, all right, we're gonna make a weird light pages thing, but it it, it encompasses all the use cases. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so now I need to try to explain what Google AMP is. And again, this is one of those things that like probably most of the people listening to this have used at some point, probably just didn't know. And they were like, why does this web page look weird and, and not have comments? Google AMP at its core was just a modern web framework. So it was like a way to build web pages. Uh, there are a lot of these. AMP was one. And it had a collection of what Google called AMP components, 
which were the blocks of code you used for uh, basically everything that was in text. So there was a component for images and image galleries and embedded videos and like ad blocks and uh, share buttons and all that fun stuff. AMP was primarily intended for just sites with articles. Uh, and those sites would have a normal web page and then an AMP version. Usually the AMP version was like automatically generated by the site based on a template. Um, but it was also technically possible to make your entire site AMP, so you wouldn't have to do that, but no, it did that because AMP was bad. The key component with AMP and, and why it was so controversial is that if you wanted your page to be what Google called AMP valid, um, you could only use AMP's own components and not basically no other embedded content or scripting. And there were maximum file size limits on page resources like CSS styling code. So even though this was basically a web page and you wrote it like a web page, you could not use normal web page stuff. Everything had to be Google's AMP components. Like you couldn't even put like an image normally in your article. It had to be like Google's image AMP component thing. This sounds annoying. <laughs> It is very annoying. Uh, websites had to maintain two versions of all the pages they wanted to be AMP. So there was the non-AMP and the AMP version. And if they wanted a good experience, they had to try to replicate as much of the normal site's functionality in AMP uh, as, as they could. Uh, again, that was really hard because of those limitations and the components that were available. And uh, AMP was again trying to be the universal solution for these sort of like lightweight mobile articles um and part of that pitch was that it was also open source so if facebook wanted they could you know take it and, and use it for their thing of course i don't i don't think they ever did so so yeah amp was very weird but now the question is why does it load fast and a big part of that answer is something called lazy loading. You know what lazy load? I know you know what lazy loading is, but can you, what is lazy loading, Adam? So it's basically, am I correct in saying that like when you load the page, you just kind of show things as they appear rather than like, uh, like how would I describe it? Like rather than say waiting for like your images to load and stuff, it's just like as you scroll down, the images will load. Like they appear when you're at the place that right. they show. Yeah, yeah, that, that's basically it. It's it's just a way of, of downloading data only when it's actually needed instead of just all at once. Yeah. So like with web articles, this makes a lot of sense because if you think of a web article, you're loading like all of the like site navigation stuff, all the core code, and then you're loading all the text of the article, which the text actually is not the hard part, it's just text. But then there's like images in there and videos and probably some ads and, and all that stuff. And the thing, you know, Facebook was talking about earlier where it takes an eternity to load these on mobile browsers is like, if you can imagine all of that trying to load at once on like an average mobile connection on a phone in like 2012 or whatever, uh, that, that took a while. So lazy loading uh makes a lot more sense here and basically all the amp components use lazy loading so you'd load an amp article you'd probably get like the text of the article all at once but stuff like the images and videos would not load until you got to that and um lazy loading was not widely used on the web in 2015 because it was difficult to implement so this change alone made a big difference compared to most sites. And that's, that's where AMP could kind of claim like, oh, we're so much more efficient because we're using this thing that is, is kind of annoying to get working. So uh, that makes our pages load faster. So a little bit later in February of 2016, a few months after the initial announcement of AMP, Google brought AMP pages to the mobile Google search website. And here's where the controversy really, really steps up. So. You've probably seen, if you try to Google something on a phone of like a, like a current event or a celebrity or, or something else that has like recent news for it, there's a little part at the top that says top stories 
and it like scrolls. Yeah, yeah, and it's like a little like horizontally scrolling section, and it has like the article titles with little images. And this is when Google introduces that to the mobile site. But here's the catch: pages would only appear in that carousel part. Articles would only show up there if they had AMP versions, and it would load the AMP version instead of the normal page. So, if I'm the BBC, and I want my article to potentially show up at the very top of a Google search result, I'm going to implement AMP, even though it's a massive pain in the butt, and it takes forever, and it's annoying for users, I'm going to do it because I want to be in that top slot. This is beginning to sound a little bit anti-competitive. I, of Google? Stop spoiling, <laughs> stop spoiling it. Goodness. Sorry, I just, I didn't think any story about Google could end with them being anti-competitive. <laughs> this never happens. Yeah, this is new. So yeah, if, if sites wanted to show up in that top section, they had to support AMP. Now, there was also the question of, would implementing AMP change a site's ranking on the, the normal search results? So like, you know, the part of Google where it's just like the normal blue links. And... Google stated repeatedly that AMP support didn't change that part. It would only it only mattered for like that top articles thing, but a lot of sites did it anyway because there there's this fun thing where Google is never like a hundred percent honest about how this stuff works because if, if they were fully transparent, then everyone would sort of game the system. So sometimes I I, I don't know if they've ever like outright like lied about something but it's like they won't say exactly what goes into these rankings so a lot of sites just implemented amp even if they weren't like trying to get into that top story section because i don't know maybe it'll help you know i think we... as well i think as well like if you're a news site and you're thinking about like oh well we want to retain users and stuff well yeah maybe it doesn't boost them in those normal search results but if they, if Google sees them as an authority where people are clicking those links because they're using, like, let's say there's breaking news, right? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's something about Taylor Swift and her many, many flights to something 13 miles away. Um, and you're using these AMP pages and therefore you're now at the top. Now, obviously this isn't in place anymore, but like, let's say that's the case, right? And you've got people clicking your articles. Google kind of has then this internal ticker that's kind of like, oh, people are clicking links to this website on our search results now obviously it's because they're being pinned at the top there but then if you search for something that's older that it's not breaking news your website there is a decent the, the theory was there's a decent chance that your website might be pushed up the rankings for that kind of stuff because google just recognizes you as a website that gets clicks it doesn't matter that the clicks came from you using those amp pages um right so that's that that was also a big worry as well yeah yeah, so like just there's there's a huge push to implement this thing that is a pain because it might help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like even indirectly. Yeah. And um later that year in October 2016, uh Google rolled out AMP links in the uh regular mobile search result pages. So if you clicked on one of the normal Google links uh and that page had an AMP version, it would load that. It still didn't like you know, for the publishers, it didn't really supposedly didn't change where the like what the rankings of those results were. But if they had AMP set up, it would load that. Over the next few years from this point, uh, other mobile apps started loading AMP pages if they were an option. Uh, the Bing, the, the Microsoft Bing app actually did this. Uh, the Twitter app did this. Um, it was for a while. It was like. Oh, this is kind of like the new like mobile version of Pages, um, but worse and more annoying. AMP received constant criticism from publishers, web developers, journalists, and a lot of other people. And for pretty much the whole time AMP was around, those complaints went unaddressed. So um, I'll, I'll read this. I'll give you a break. I'll read this uh, snippet of an article by Scott Gilbertson. Uh, for the register. This was published in May 2017. Okay. Uh, Scott said, quote, 
So far, AMP actually sounds appealing, except that hilariously, to create an AMP page, you have to load a, wait for it, yes, a JavaScript file from Google. <laughs> the founder of Pinboard actually recreated the Google AMP demo page without the Google AMP JavaScript, and unsurprisingly, it's faster than Google's version. So, it's not really about speed. As with anything that eschews standards for its own modified version thereof, it's about lock-in. Tons of pages in Google AMP markup mean tons of pages that are optimized specifically for Google and indexed primarily by Google and shown primarily to Google users. It's Google's attempt to match Facebook's platform. And yes, Facebook is far worse than AMP, but that doesn't mean Google AMP is a good idea. At least Facebook doesn't try to pretend like it's open. The second thing you need to do for AMP is to get rid of all your analytics data. Instead, you can only peek at a small subset of the data Google gathers. That's the AMP analytics deal in a nutshell. Why would anyone want to strip out their own analytics, homegrown features like interactive maps or photo galleries, and create pages that won't even be shown with their own URL or branding? To get in Google's top stories carousel, of course, all the cool publications are doing it, and that's a problem. Quote. The, the conspiracy theorist in me also wonders how much this was about optimizing Google's placement of ads using the automatic placement of them on these pages. Because if you think about it, it's like a homogenized kind of system that they know kind of how all pages are laid out if they're using AMP. Yeah. Makes yeah. You think. And <laughs> <laughs> well, the the ads thing is is sort of the closest um, anyone got to like suing Google for antitrust stuff because, you know, because you couldn't really use custom code, you were limited to whatever AMP supported. And of course, AMP supported Google's ads right out of the box. But it took a while for other ad networks to get like fully approved and, and working in this. Um, and of course, if you had like, you know, if I'm a website like selling my own ads, uh, that might be harder to implement in this as well. So I know that was part of a larger uh, antitrust suit that I think, uh, I think the state of Texas was, was suing Google over. This was part of that, but I believe that part kind of got thrown out. Um, but it, it was like more of a pain uh, to, to do that kind of stuff. I've got uh, another snippet of an article. This is from David Pierce in The Verge from May 2023. I'm going to make you read this. According to interviews with former employees, publishing executives, and experts associated with the early days of AMP, while it was waxing poetic about the value and future of the open web, Google was privately urging publishers into handing over near total control of how their articles worked and looked and monetized. And it was wielding the world's most powerful, or the web's most powerful real estate, the top of search results, to get its way. Google came to us and said, "This is in quotes." Google said, "Came to us and said, the internet is broken. Ads aren't loading. Blah blah blah. We want to provide a better user experience to users by coming up with this clean standard." End quote. Says one magazine product e executive. Quote again. My reaction was that the main problem is ads. So why don't you fix the ads? They said they can't fix the ads. It's too hard. End quote. The audience people hated it because it was against audience strategy, says one former media executive who worked with AMP. Quote, the data people hated it because it was against advertising and privacy strategy. The engineers hated it because it's a horrendous format to work with. The analysts hated it because we got really bad behavioral data out of it. Everyone's like, okay, so there's no upside to this apart from the traffic, end quote. On top of that, the traffic was worthless because it had fewer and more limited ads. Quote, Every publisher experienced this. The AMP audience is less valuable. It's millions of pennies and not having any dollars, one executive says. An AMP article earned 60% of what a standard article earned. It's low enough to be noticeable. You were just playing the game of, if I didn't have all this traffic, would I make more money? End quote. So um, I'll have, the, I'll have the, this Verge article in the, the show notes along with all the other sources. It's a, it's a great article about kind of all the issues with AMP. And this was a big part of it is like, it, it was a pain to implement. It was harder to make revenue from. The sites couldn't use like all of their existing analytics and like their own tools for, for making articles better. It was just like, no one liked this. Uh, no one, no one in the industry liked this. It was stupid. It was a pain. Um, and also, it was annoying for the people using it too. So, I no, n none of this is a win, basically. So, 
uh, in, in terms of ways this was annoying for users, uh, trying to share AMP articles was the most annoying thing possible because depending on where you copied the link from, you could get the original article link, which is what, what you want. You could get the AMP version oh, of the article, yeah. which uh, looked really bad if you like tried to open it on a uh, like a desktop computer uh because it would it would be like a mobile site like it's like one column it's missing a bunch of stuff or you would get the amp version mirrored on google server because that was part of why amp was so fast is because once google found your amp page it would create a mirrored copy on its own servers and of course google servers are better than most other companies so it loaded faster not to, not to mention as well, I think they actually used regionalized servers, so like yeah. they would copy it to multiple locations. So if you're, say, a European reading an American website, and the American website might only be using American servers, if you were loading one of these AMP pages and you were in Europe, it might actually load it on, say, a Google CDN that's in Ireland. So then, for me, that's brilliant. It'll load much faster than the, the original one, just because the latency is so much lower. Uh, but then the downside, obviously, is that it's AMP, and it's, it's mirrored to Google, and yeah, yeah, and like, you know, for the for the people that are like trying to not dump all their data into Google, like if someone sends you an AMP article, uh, Google knows you loaded that AMP article if you clicked it. Yeah, yeah. Also, if you were like using Google Search on your phone and you clicked an AMP link in Search, the the website loaded in a frame inside Google's site. You never left Google dot com. It just was like a small thing like appearing below. And like they added a header at the top to have like the original link. But of course, you had to remember to look up there and copy the link from there if you wanted to do that. Um, and then your your browser URL bar was showing like some jumbled mess of like whatever cache server Google was using. The, the other thing was uh, most sites didn't duplicate all their functionality in the AMP versions of pages. So a lot of stuff like polls or comment sections uh, could be missing. So like you'd click on an article, maybe from like a site you, you recognize and you're like, oh yeah, I, I know this site has comments. I wonder what like, people were saying about it. And you click on it, not knowing you got to the AMP version, you'd scroll to the bottom and be like, wait, where's the comments? Why, why is this page worse? I don't understand. Uh, the, the other really fun part was that in a lot of cases there was not a way to get to the regular version of a page from the AMP version. So if you, if you clicked on a link inside Google mobile search, it would have a little header at the top that showed the original article URL. But like if someone sent you that AMP link, or if like you just got to that AMP link somehow on your own, there's not really a good way <laughs> to get to the, the normal link. Some sites uh, did like, on their own at a click here to go to the regular version of the page link somewhere in it. But I, I almost never saw that uh, back in the day. I remember like, I think Ars Tenica did it. Uh, I don't remember a lot of other sites doing it. I remember just hating coming across AMP pages. I, yeah, it was, like it was so bad. It was just a pain. For a while I was using Firefox on my Android phone and someone made an extension that like redirected AMP pages to the normal article. Uh, that was really nice. To summarize, publishers hated this. Uh, writers hated this. Uh, users either hated this or were confused by it and didn't know why. <laughs> so, great stuff. It's literally um, the but, meme of everyone dislikes that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, except Google, because you stay on Google.com. So that's yeah, yeah. Go Google, Google loved it. <laughs> Google's like, I see this as an absolute win. Yeah. <laughs> so Google's like main attempt to make this less confusing was a, a new browser technology called web packaging. So again, we talked about how depending on where you like looked, you could get different links to this, to this article that was in AMP format. Um, web packaging was proposed as a way for sites to allow cached versions of their pages using signed HTTP exchanges 
which would then allow those cached versions to display the original URL in the address bar. So in English, that means like once AMP implemented this and a browser implemented this, if you clicked on an AMP page, it would show the actual article URL in the address bar. It wouldn't show the AMP version. It wouldn't show like if it was on Google servers, it wouldn't show that. It would just be like the, the original whatever link, even if that was different from what you were looking at. When Google introduced this as like a, a potential web standard, you know, they, they came up with a few different reasons why this might be beneficial, but like everyone knew this was just for AMP. This was, this was Google trying to solve a problem that it itself created. Uh, and uh, this did eventually roll out to Google Chrome. And then because a lot of browsers are based on Chrome, it showed up in a lot of them too. Uh, but Mozilla and Apple did not add it to their browsers. I have a, a big statement from uh, Mozilla. They, they did a very long, detailed document about why they would not do this. Uh, and they said, quote, The most disruptive feature of the proposal, Origin Substitution, describes a fundamental change to the security architecture of the web. In addition to a significant increase in complexity, Origin Substitution, which is the thing where the, the address bar shows something different, uh, creates new angles of attack that site operators need to consider before they adopt the technology. Changes to the way sites operate could result in non-trivial security risks. So Mozilla never put this in Firefox. Uh, Apple never put it in Safari uh, because it's stupid. <laughs> this was only made to, to try to make AMP less confusing. Uh, but instead it like <laughs> changed how web browsers work in a pretty big way. And it was... It, it, no one wanted to go for that either. So in October of 2019, Google moved the AMP project to the OpenJS Foundation, which was already managing projects like jQuery and Node.js. Uh, Google had already given up some control of AMP with the new governance structure in 2018, so the year before this. Uh, and, and Google kept employing some developers to work on AMP full-time, so it wasn't entirely like a, you know, them showing up to open JS and be like, here you go. Here's your, <laughs> here's your new toys. Um, but it was, it was a little bit like that. And, and that move was sort of criticized as, as Google looking for uh, like the, the web developers approval after it had already made everyone mad, <laughs> sort of like, yeah. well, you know, it's, it's open now. We don't even have control over it. So it's fine now. Right. Like the, <laughs> your, your issue was that we controlled all of it. Right. That is very Google, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, guys, I don't know what the problem is. It's open source. Yeah. yeah. Look, we've even given it to someone else. <laughs> it's yeah. not our problem anymore. You can't sue us for <laughs> anti-competitive practices. We don't have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's very close to the argument of uh, you can't sue us for anti-competitive practices. We don't have any competitors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thankfully, uh, AMP's stated purpose of creating fast web pages for mobile was becoming more unnecessary as time went on. Um, the, the big change here is that, uh, lazy loading images became just a feature built into web browsers, starting with Chrome version 77 in 2019, and then support for lazy loading other embedded elements came later. So... This is the thing where when, you know, this is a big reason why we don't really have this issue as much anymore, where like you click on an article on your phone and it takes 10 seconds to load. That still happens sometimes, but uh, now it doesn't necessarily need to happen. And on a lot of sites load very quickly because they're using the same lazy load technology that AMP had. Also mobile processing power and average network speeds uh, had continued to improve. And before this, the logic for making mobile websites was like, all right, most of our users are on desktop. So it's like kind of okay if we only have a desktop website, no one cares. Um, but it would be nice to also have a mobile website because there's a pretty big percentage of people that are doing web browsing for phones. But what eventually happens is mobile devices become the majority of global web traffic instead of desktop platforms. So this idea of creating a secondary worse experience for mobile devices 
didn't really make sense anymore because they were now the majority. And I saw one one estimate from Stat Stats Statsia Stat Statista uh, that <laughs> estimated. You're on your own for this word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that estimated worldwide web traffic from mobile devices reached 50 percent in the fourth quarter of 2016, and then with the newest data I saw, which was in the fourth quarter of 2023, that was around 55 percent. So. The majority of web traffic now is coming from mobile devices. That's that's how stuff is being built now. With like, we're making the website that will look good and kind of work okay on phones first, and then we'll scale it up and kind of make it for desktop. So then, in June of 2021, uh, Google started allowing non-AMP articles to show up in that top story section. That was originally the big incentive for sites to build AMP versions, and now that was gone, and then AMP very quickly started to drop off. Uh, sites were just ripping them out now, like, okay, we're done with this now. We don't need this anymore. Isn't it great when something like this just highlights how much control Google has? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's very fun. Some sites went back to using just one shared site for both mobile and desktop, and then I, f I saw in the reporting at the time a few others kind of made new optimized mobile sites that were kind of the same concept like it was like a different experience to load faster um but a lot of them just did you know one website for both uh, that's kind of just the standard now and at least those websites that did do something different they were still doing it with like the html standard it wasn't some weird like new thing right they they could make their web pages how they wanted it wasn't necessarily like you know Again, going back to the thing where like Google has a lot of control over them still, but it's yeah. not like, oh, thank goodness, we can use a normal image. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If we don't use this proper image, we'll all be fired and our search traffic will tank. <laughs> yeah. Uh, going back to Facebook Instant Articles, which was one of those inspirations for AMP, uh, that was discontinued entirely in 2023. Uh, Meta, the company that owns Facebook now, said less than 3% of feed posts contained links to news articles, and uh, instant articles were underutilized. So b because they had, over the years, like shifted away from caring about like news and allowing people to share news and kind of building their app around that, uh, fewer people did that now, and also sites stopped caring about uh instant articles so uh there wasn't really a reason to do that anymore um as of when we're recording this in february of 2024 uh amp as a project is i'm not gonna say dead because there's still like activity on they have like a, a couple like github repositories where they have all the code for amp and like there's still activity in there but the releases are pretty rare and they're not like adding anything they're just sort of like keeping it alive and, and adding support for more stuff there hasn't been a blog post on the amp website since 2022 and the twitter account has been dead since 2021 i did like kind of browse around for a while to see which sites still support amp because if if you use google search on a phone and the site supports amp it will still load the amp version yeah so I did see AMP pages uh, when I clicked on stuff from The Guardian, PBS, The Hill, uh, and Digital Trends were a few of those. I found uh, a lot of sites not using AMP, like Washington Post, CNN, Tom's Guide, CNET, Mac Rumors, uh, USA Today, and the Wall Street Journal. And again, like Google will still load the AMP pages if they're there, but it, it wouldn't really be surprising to me if that gets ripped out sometime soon like maybe even this year so in other words amp may not be dead but it's certainly limping right now <laughs> yeah I, I it's mostly i think it's just mostly alive out of momentum like a yeah. lot of the sites that implemented amp like three years ago they're like it's fine i i don't want to touch it <laughs> like if i yeah, touch yeah. it something might go wrong <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 the life of a software engineer in a nutshell yeah, it's like, don't touch the amp, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is in a perfect equilibrium where everything works. Please don't touch it. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's Google Amp. Uh, it was a stupid web thing that no one liked, and thankfully it's almost gone. And one thing I did like about that Verge article, and again, that's in the show notes, is 
a lot of the trust Google had built with publishers just completely eradicated through this. Yeah. Please, please spend so many hours and, and support time and everything on our stupid little standard. And you, we, we might get you some traffic in return. Maybe. We're not promising anything. <laughs> yeah, because it, it was worse for everyone. Like, I remember um, when, I, when I worked at Android Police uh, years ago, uh, I, I mostly just did, like, writing there. Like, I was writing news and reviews and stuff. But I also did a couple uh, development things. Like, I made some internal tools for the writers. And I, I helped make the, the dark theme on the on the website and i i didn't really do anything with the amp support but i because i was doing that dev work i was in like the slack room where all the uh, other web devs were talking and i was seeing like all the work going into amp and it was like wow this this is so many <laughs> this is so many billable hours <laughs> that could have been spent on anything else <laughs> yeah, yeah. literally anything else <laughs> Yeah, because, like, Android Police was one of those websites that was trying to make their AMP page, like, as close to the normal site as possible. And I saw, like, so many discussions about, like, oh, we have a, you know, our image gallery looks completely different than, you know, the image gallery in AMP. Can we make the one in AMP look more like our normal website? And can we make, like, the branding match and blah, blah, blah. And it was, just, it was so much work. It was crazy. Did anybody at so. any given point just say No. <laughs> Uh, no, because uh, Artem was the boss, and uh, Artem wanted to look at that way. So I see. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, in the end, like Android Police probably had like one of the best amp sites I'd ever seen. Um, I don't know if it was worth it in the end, but uh, a, a big issue with how websites retained users, where a lot of these websites had very distinctive looks. And AMP sort of encourage you to do a very like basic look, like a almost like a default blog theme. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of websites that just take an article from somewhere else and like replace some of the words and publish it because that might show up on Google search. It, it gets to the point where like those random like trash sites uh, look the same as like your AMP page. I can't tell anymore by looking at this website <laughs> if it's legitimate or not. It kind of just looks yeah. like all the other ones. I remember it created a bit of a homogenized look across the internet for a while as yeah. you go through Google search results. And it's just basic page with like the little header at the top, feature image, author name, text. And that was basically every page <laughs> that was in a yeah. search result. So that's that's Google AMP. Uh, good t Good times. Do you have any plugs before we get out of here? Yes. Um... So, unfortunately, I'm still active on Twitter. Uh, so, my Twitter is Adam Conway IE. I'm also on Mastodon, uh, Adam Conway at Mastodon.ie. Uh, I'm also on Blue Sky, which is Adam Conway.ie. And then I'm on Threads as Adam Conway IE. There's a lot of, there's a lot of IEs there. They don't stand for Internet Explorer. They stand for um, Ireland. So, yeah. Also, TikTok. I do bits on TikTok. And then my general, uh, that, that again is Adam Conway IE, in case you're you know, wondering. Uh, I really only use one of two usernames. And then uh, finally, I also write articles for XCA developers where I do technical in-depth dives and all that kind of stuff if you're interested in reading about any of us. Um, so yeah, that's that's more or less me. Wow. So so Ireland is truly the Internet Explorer of countries, is what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, we only really officially declared a constitution 104 years ago, so we were a bit behind the times. <laughs> Took a while, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. You know, you got there in the end. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Tech Tales is uh, on Mastodon at techtales at mas.to. The uh, link for that is in the show notes. Also in the show notes are all of the sources, along with links to support the show through Patreon, PayPal, Cash App, and other stuff. And uh, thank you for listening. And we'll be back in your podcast feed soon. Bye.